Welcome friends, Katrina here with Homegrown Florida. Let's talk watermelons. I have been unsuccessfully growing watermelons for five long and frustrating years. But this year I made some really good progress and I wanted to share my experiences with you in case you have also been struggling with growing them in your garden. So I've come up with six tips to growing super big watermelons in your backyard garden. Let's jump right into it. I know that some of you are going to tell me that growing watermelons in Florida is the easiest plant to grow in our super warm climate, but for some reason, watermelons have been my nemesis for a very long time. The first year I tried growing them, I planted sugar baby watermelons from seed in my raised bed at my old house though. The vines started growing like crazy and I didn't even get one watermelon to pollinate. So I researched it and I realized I wasn't getting enough pollinators. So the next year I started hand pollinating. And if you haven't seen that video of how to hand pollinate, I'm gonna put that down in the description below. I was able to get like three or four watermelons pollinated, which I thought was pretty amazing for one plant. They got about the size of a softball. Here, I'll show you. About this size. We're gonna talk about these in a minute. But they got about the size of a softball and then the vines started dying and turning yellow and the fruit never matured. I went back to the drawing board and I realized I wasn't fertilizing correctly. Well, let me just be honest. I wasn't fertilizing at all. <laughs> this was before I learned that fertilizing regularly and working to improve the soil, you know, basically causes your plant to starve if you don't do these things. If you want to know more about how to fertilize your garden, I'll also put that video down in the description. In fact, just check the description for all the videos on all the steps. <laughs> so on year three, I got my melons growing, pollinated, fertilizer. I was doing really well, even got one to a full size, but before it could mature, my plant got a really bad fungus issue and then just all died, which is actually what's happening right here. <laughs> These that you see right here are not watermelons. I'm trying to find, oh, these are the watermelons and they have pretty much virtually died completely out because of the same thing, a fungal issue. We're going to talk more about that. But I also started learning about pickle worms that year because they had managed to burrow into a couple of my immature melons. So that's right. Not only did I get a fungus that I couldn't grow anymore, but the three or four that I had grown now had worms inside of them and I didn't notice it and the melon started to rot. So couldn't eat those. So now we're at year four. I got the melons all the way to maturity with a little bit of fungal issue and a little bit of picker worm damage, but I had two melons that made it to the very end and I was stoked. <laughs> but then I picked them too soon. <laughs> okay guys. They were a very light pink in the center, but mostly white. I almost gave up at that point. And if you've gotten to know me even a little bit through this channel, you know I'm not easily deterred. But man, if we didn't love watermelons as much as we do, and if they were not so expensive in the stores, I would have given up. I was, I was really close. I think my husband was the one who was like, try again one more time, honey. <laughs> so I did. And so here we are at year five and I went all in. Watermelons were one of my four goals from the spring season. If you remember our spring planning guide, I had put four things that I wanted to focus on. Flowers, native plants, watermelons, and I can't remember the fourth one. Um, you'll see it, I'll pop up a video right here. But watermelons were my go-to. I was like, I'm gonna do it this spring. So I spent a lot of time researching, going through my notes from previous years, and I put a plan in place. And here's what I did. Make sure to stay to the end because I'm going to show you the results. First, I started my melons much earlier this spring, like January. 
I had to start them in pots because we were still getting frost coming through and that would have killed them. My reason for starting so early was that I wanted to grow the melons during our drought season, which is early spring. So that way I could avoid as much fungal issues as possible. Since I had such terrible results with sugar baby watermelon varieties, I decided to go with six new varieties. So I researched a bunch of varieties that would do well here in Florida and I narrowed it down to Crimson Sweet, Tender Sweet Seedless Hybrid, Moon and Stars, Congo, Choi Chow, and Jubilee. I knew I wanted two melons per bed, but I seeded double that just in case. Well, actually it was more like quadrupling it. So there's two seeds in each cell of the tray and I did two cells per variety. So a total of 12 cells with each cell having two plants. This was just in case. <laughs> I told you I'm going all in. So mid-February, I transplanted the six plants out into my three beds that I allowed for the three beds. Guys, that's a lot of beds to give to watermelons, but I won't, I'm going all in. I made sure the beds were close to each other to help with pollination, and also that way they were my most full sun beds, which these guys are. Watermelons like a lot of sun and warmth, so I made sure that they were in the beds in the garden that received zero shade. I put two plants in each bed at opposite ends. They don't really need that much space, but I really wanted to go all in, so I wanted to give them a ton of space to grow. I added some tomato tone fertilizer into the planting hole. I know they're not tomatoes, but they are a fruiting plant like tomatoes, so it's kind of interchangeable. And I put that into the planting hole when I planted the, the transplants. I then started a schedule to follow so every two weeks I would spray them with a water and hydrogen peroxide mixture which is 10 tablespoons to one gallon of water. This was to keep the fungal issues down as long as possible. Then once a month I sprayed the plants with spinocide, sp spinocide, which is an organic pesticide that kills soft body bugs like pickle worms. I'm not a huge fan of spraying things but I was determined to grow these melons this year. The next thing on my schedule was fertilizing once a month. This entailed scratching in a couple tablespoons of the tomato tone. You could also use garden tone. And then I also mixed a couple ounces of fish fertilizer with a couple of gallons of water um, to water it with. I was going to make sure that fertilizer was not an issue this year. When the flowers showed up, I started hand pollinating. But I quickly figured out that I didn't need to because all that work that I had done in the garden on the other goals, like the natives and the flowers, was bringing in plenty, plenty of pollinators. And so I didn't have to pollinate. The vines had gotten so crazy out of control that I was having a hard time finding the female flowers. So after a couple weeks of the flowers opening, I would just hunt through the vines and try to find baby watermelons, which worked because all the pollinators. Once I located the little melons, I would take them and um, use these trays and put them underneath so that that way the melons were not touching the ground below since bugs, worms, slugs could burrow into them from underneath. I quickly realized as the fruit grew that these little trays were not going to hold these big of watermelons. Maybe the sugar babies, but not these. The trays just kept digging down in the soil the bigger the melons get. One of you guys sent me a video on knowing when to pick your watermelons because that was my next big hurdle and I noticed in the video that the guy set his watermelons in big pots, like planting pots. It was genius. <laughs> so I grabbed a bunch of my big pots and I set them all in there and it worked perfectly. Just be careful because I accidentally snapped a couple of the melons trying to get them into the pots. They were fairly big at that point. So next time I'll put them in the pots before they get big to help keep them from snapping too early. If you're enjoying this little watermelon adventure of mine, make sure that you don't forget to hit that notification bell below. You'll be the first to know whenever I release a new video packed with gardening tips. So go ahead and give that little bell a tap and let's stay connected. I actually didn't go super crazy with the watering of the watermelons. I watered them about the same as any other plant and that seems to work fine, but I did concentrate the watering just to the base of the plant and not the whole bed. I wanted to keep the leaves of this plant super dry. So by just watering the one area where the roots were, I felt like I could you know, keep pushing off that fungal disease. 
But then our rain started, and that was when I got a crazy fungal disease that took over the plants in a matter of a week. <laughs> the whole plant, all three beds, it spread so quickly. So as an experiment, I stripped the leaves from that bed over there, and I left the leaves on this bed over here, but I sprayed them with hydrogen peroxide every three days. And then on opposite days, I sprayed them with a citric acid spray just alternating back and forth to see if the stripped melons would be okay versus the ones that I was spraying. And to be honest, I don't think one way or the other helped. <laughs> Stripping the leaves or spraying at that point, once it started, the plants were done. But I did leave the melons on there and they didn't really experience any problems from the disease other than the fact that some like these guys, you know, clearly were not large enough uh, for harvest and once the vines died, they kind of died as well. I knew they weren't really going to grow anymore at that point, uh, especially with no leaves, but I wanted to leave them on there so that they could ripen. Thankfully at that point the melons, most of the melons, were fully grown, so I just left them to do their thing. The final and most important part was knowing when to pick your watermelons. I have heard it all. <laughs> Yellow spot, thump sound, brown tendril, let me tell you what actually worked for me. The yellow spot was too hard for me because when you look at it every day or every couple days, the white spot versus the yellow spot is kind of hard to distinguish. And if you're not sure what that thump sound should sound like, you won't know if it's the right sound. And once again, you're doing it every couple days, so the sound kind of blends together. The one that worked the best for me was the tendril. So all watermelons have a green tendril that uh, comes out right next to where the stem of the watermelon attaches to the vine. That green tendril is part of the plant that usually grabs onto things to help the plant climb. But this one won't be grabbing onto anything because this is where the melon is. Wait till that tendril starts to brown. Initially, I didn't wait for it to turn completely brown so the melons that I picked were not ripe enough. Then I waited for it to turn brown the entire length of the tendril and it was a bit overripe. So what I have learned is that to let that tendril dry out and turn brown almost all the way to the stem. If the only part of the tendril that is still green is the little tiny millimeter attached to the main stem, that's the right time. That is the perfect time. Especially if you like your melons to have that crisp texture and not like the spongy texture. A couple days before I was planning on pulling them, I stopped watering them to help them concentrate their sweetness. And I was finally successful. I harvested three fully ripe, beautiful melons weighing about 40 pounds. If this one's not ready, I might give up. <laughs> this is the sun and stars. It doesn't have like a super yellow bottom, but the, the top was dried completely up. I'm cutting. <gasps> oh, it split. Be careful. <laughs> yeah, when it splits like that, it's good then. Oh, it's closer than what any other one has been. Mm. All right, let's see. Lift this bad boy. Oh, let's go. Please be good. I'm making myself nervous. Man, these are... Uh-oh, they're making me really nervous. I'm making myself nervous. <laughs> don't cut yourself. I'm trying not to. Oh, man, don't put your fingers in it, too. Okay, you ready? Oh, look at that. That looks pretty good. It's an orange watermelon. It is? Yeah. Try it. Let's try it. Oh, I think it's a good spot. Or 
Yeah. Are you gonna make it's warm? Before that, I had harvested four or five that were not ripe yet. I also had somewhere between three and five melons that died along the process, either from bug damage or they were too small like these guys when the fungal issue hit, or third, they snapped off when I was trying to put them in the pots. So altogether, my six plants made somewhere between 11 and 12 melons, which is about two melons per plant. That's good. I was happy with that. Now let me tell you the winner from a variety perspective. The Chow Cho and Jubilee didn't produce not one melon, <laughs> not one. The Crimson Sweet produced one melon and it was the earliest producer. So even though it didn't produce a lot, it was the earliest. Tender Sweet, which is a hybrid and it's seedless, produced three melons and they were by far the largest, <laughs> but they weren't that sweet. I think the orange varieties just aren't as sweet as the red ones. The Congo seems like a late variety because it produced a lot of melons, but they were so late in the season, they didn't make it to the end because of that fungal issue. The true winner, tried and true, you heard it from me, was the moon and stars. <laughs> wow, I mean, this was an overachiever melon variety. All the remaining melons were from this variety. The size was really good because they were not super huge, so really easy to store and use. They also produced the most flowers, male and female. I'm pretty sure that all of the melons were pollinated from that one single plant, that one variety. I'm gonna grow this variety from now on. It's just super productive. It held out the longest from the disease and it produces very, very quickly. Lots of flowers and bonus, the actual melons were very sweet. I really like them. They didn't get a perfect red throughout the inside, but it was still really nice and I enjoyed them a lot. I hope this video might have helped some of you aspiring watermelon growers. Make sure to head down into the comments and leave me your watermelon growing tips. If you wanna watch a couple more of my videos, I'm gonna pop them up right now. You can check those out between now and my next upload. Happy gardening, guys. <laughs>